Ani, welcome. Lori Beavis, Indigenous Cause. My name is Lori Beavis, Peterborough and Rice Lake, Ontario, Duwanjaba. My source community is Peterborough and Hiawatha First Nation at Rice Lake, Ontario. Wawishkika, Nododum, my clan is the deer, the helpers. I am Lori Beavis, daughter of Lois and Al, granddaughter of Laura and Bert, and Lorena and Ken. The people I come from worked hard, fed and guided people, were caregivers, factory workers, educators, artistic crafters, and tellers of stories. My maternal family is Michisagig, Mississauga and Nishinaabe, from Rice Lake, Ontario, and of Welsh descent. My paternal family is Irish. My Irish Welsh ancestors are settlers who arrived in Michisagi territory of Nogojawan in the early 19th century. I tell this information to locate myself. It is important as a part of the Anishinaabe protocol for the speaker to situate herself across physical, cultural and social landscapes and as a way to establish connections personally and professionally. This is also a way to remain conscious of the importance of cultural location and cultural knowledge. Indigenous people have always introduced themselves and recognized the territory and lands they live on and visit. Today I am located in Jajage at Montreal, Jajage in the language of the Ganagahaka, Munyang in the language of the Anishinaabe. I'm a visitor on this territory and I'm honored to live and work here. Jajagi is the unceded indigenous land and traditional territory of both the Ganekahaka, Mohawk, and the Anishinaabe Algonquin peoples, and has historically been a gathering place for many First Nations. Please take a moment to acknowledge the people on the land on which you are located today. Why do we make a land acknowledgement? A territorial acknowledgement is a statement recognizing the traditional territories of the people who called the land home before the arrival of settlers, and in, and in many cases still do call it home. An acknowledgement is an activation of Indigenous culture and recognizes a rich history of governance as one that continues in each territory and will go forward into the future. We, the organizers, wanted to open the environment, environmental racism as garbage symposium in a good way. We welcome everyone from near and far to this digital space. You are cherished guests here, and we hope you enjoy, learn, and become inspired. Megwitch, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Thank you very much, um, Lori. Um, my name is Myra Hurd, and uh, I have the uh, I have the joy of welcoming all of you to this symposium, and I have the privilege of introducing Lakaluk. So, I just want to say that I am a first generation uh, settler on my father's side. Uh, my my paternal family comes from uh, the United Kingdom. And I am second generation uh, settler Canadian on my mother's side. I was born in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. And like Lori and, uh, and Hillary, I, uh, I have the, uh, the privilege of uh, living in uh, Jijolge. And I have the privilege of uh, working in Kingston, Ontario, which is uh, on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee land. I am grateful for all of the extreme work that everyone has done to get this symposium going. And I am especially thrilled to introduce Lakaluk. As, uh, as you all know, Lakaluk uh, Williamson Bathory is an award-winning performance artist. She's a poet, she's an actor, she's a curator, she's a storyteller and a writer. I think she probably never sleeps because she does so much. She has won numerous awards and I wanna draw everyone's attention to the fact that Lakaluk has been nominated for a Sobe Award. So she has been, uh, she has been shortlisted for this and um, that's very, very exciting. Um, Lakaluk lives in Hallowood with her husband and her children, and uh, she's coming to us from Hallowood. So um, 
uh, <laughs> uh, internet uh, is a fickle thing and Arctic internet is uh, perhaps even more fickle. So um, Nakluk just wanted to say that um, she will do her best with the, with the, um, with the internet that she has and um, she's going to, uh, to speak to us for uh, the next 15 or so minutes. And then uh, we will have a, a question and answer period. We'll probably go to around uh, 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Standard Time. And um, I would ask that any questions that you have, you put them in the chat and we will be uh, monitoring the chat and, um, and then and then uh, I, um, we will be um, uh, asking your questions, uh, asking like, look, uh, your questions. So again, please, wh whatever questions that you have that you have during uh, like, Luke's uh, um, um, performance uh, or afterwards, please just put them in the chat. We'll be watching them, um, and uh, and uh, we'll be happy to 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 speak to them. Okay, well, um, without further ado, you're not here to listen to me, you're here to listen to Lac Luc. So um, it is with my, with great pleasure and honor that I, that I, I turn it over to you, Lac Luc. One, brown rock braided with strips of green. Rivers eagerly searching and surging towards ever lower ground. And finally spilling orgasmically into the ocean. That ocean rhythmically sending up white cats mirroring the shapes of beluga whales swimming in the shallows. On sunny days and on the right approach, I'm able to pick out our family cabin nestled in at the end of Tikkut. And once satisfied with the sighting, my eyes trail along the shore until they bump into the American army base, the dump site at the farthest end of Nyakumut, an orange and brown rusted toxic cliff, barely knit together, bits of Cold War sludge and cast-offs. My ears pop as my plane lowers to the ground and the spatters of little box houses, blue, red, beige, and a little more beige. The kids whirl their bikes, the dogs shit. The teenagers giggle and scuffle and smokers flick their cigarettes. And the joggers puff their chests, and tuck their tailbones in. The tides yawn and sigh and zippers Hunters zip into town, bringing seawater dipped seal meat and geese that need plucking and roasting. Dust rises up into the streets and settles back down into the hills around Iqaduit. The hills that hold the micro jungle of Nuna, where the bumblebees bombinate and lick and rub one alluring bloom after another. It seems like a dream now, when we could all lean over to the windows of the airplane and watch town quickly grow at the border, the border of two vastnesses, the edge of Baffin Island and the ocean. Two, Yekhaluin has a shanty town. 
And it's no coincidence. It's on the strip of Inuit own land in the middle of the city. The rest of the city is regulated, surveyed, serviced, sliced and diced. The Queen's land, crown land, Inuit own land, or I-O-L, is delineated by the Nunavut Agreement. Inuit organizations decide what to do with it on the surface and the subsurface. This particular parcel of IOL is on the beach, where Inuit keep sheds for hunting equipment and spare parts, and where Inuit who have gone into arrears build plywood shacks to live in, where Inuit who have no choice have no chance of moving up onto the list of social housing squat, where Inuit who have lost their student housing put up tents to keep their families out of the wind. Where Inuit whose homes are overcrowded find reprieve in small spaces of their own. Where Inuit with mental health issues make shelter. The beach, the I-O-L, the shanty town, smells like naphtha spurting into camping stoves, rancid seal fat, motor oil, and unsoaked skin. I'm not telling you this so that you can gawk at it. I'm not giving you savory bits of gossip. I'm not showing you anything of pornographic value. This parcel of I-O-L is Anosak, a patch of ground where the snow has melted, an oasis for Inuit that have nowhere else to go. Three, picture now row upon row of airplane seats filled with mostly white people, making pie charts and filling spreadsheets and highlighting text in PDF, sound canceling headphones on, sitting erect and alert on their bowed heads like guard dogs. Inuit kids press their chubby faces between the seats, trying to twinkle eye the people that are seated behind them. Inuktitut banter, floats back and forth between the aisles and rows. Young families fall asleep on each other's shoulders and the odd medical patient groans as they reposition their freshly healing body. Sometimes in the monotony of the engines carrying us, you make eye contact with a beaming man. You smile back and take in his buzz cut his blue sweatshirt, the cop sitting next to him, and eventually his hands locked together in handcuffs. When we finally land, the white folk who are arriving in Akaduit for the very first time nervously zip up their coats and put their hats on and wrap their scarves on and clutch at their backs. There's a smattering of applause for the Inuit that are happy to be back on the ground. Babies get popped into a mountain, and we all inhale deeply as we debark the plane. If you were to take a cross section of any airplane ride between Ottawa and Iqaluit, you wouldn't get a cross section of life in Iqaluit, but you will certainly get a cross section of the mechanics of this colonized machine we live in. Four, right now, right now outside this building, the entire city becomes Agosaka, 
what is found when the snow melts. We're getting that, that spring snow that falls and makes the winter snow disappear. It's the time of year when the receding snow reveals the truths that have been hidden for a year. All the chip bags, the garbage bags, the juice containers, the beer cans, lost shoes and abandoned things. The city wakes up from hibernation, all mingled, filthy, wet, and a little bit slimy. Uncover the perennial, the persistent, the perpetual, the abiding rule for how this community works. Colonization is the largest industry in the Arctic and Inuit poverty is a manufactured product of this industry. Five. Why make an industry of making people poor in their own homeland? Why exploit? What is there to exploit? Problematization. Take away self-esteem and replace with capitalism. Take away certainty and replace with self-soothing. Take away food sovereignty and replace with food insecurity. Take away language and culture and replace with underachieving education levels. Take away land-based life work and replace with unemployment. Take away children and replace with heartache. Take away women and replace with loss. And out, out come the calipers and the calculators to problem solve all the problematization. And suddenly there's a capital city filled with people hired to problem solve. The problem solvers need offices and houses and roads to connect the two. You need wiring and plumbing. You need days of the week in order to schedule the work, and you need a weekend of rest in order to be able to do more work next week. You need a store to buy all the things that you need to fill your house and your office and fix the roads, and you need diesel to fuel the ship that brings the diesel to make the electricity that heats your house. <laughs> you know, we still aren't meeting all the markers of success in this capitalized world. The colonial machine is chugging along just fine. Six. There are barely any passengers on those flights anymore. Look at us. We're all sitting at home, waiting for those words lockdown and intubation to go away. None of what has done so well in the pandemic, even though our deaths are glaring. A mother goes south for a C-section and dies of COVID. A father goes south for heart surgery and dies of COVID. A grandmother goes south for cancer treatment and dies of COVID. We have a strict border between us and the South. Two weeks of guarded quarantine in designated hubs. It's the only way that COVID has not completely taken over our lungs this past year. Who would have thought that the isolation hubs would become emergency shelter for the homeless? You hear news reports of how unruly hub guests are breaking quarantine rules and having to start their two week stay all over again. And then you hear the stories of Inuit 
who have no safe place to go once isolation is done. What does it mean when living under guard is a welcome relief to homelessness? Seven, when you Google Inuit housing, these are the words that come up. Crisis, lack of access, overcrowded, ill-equipped. When you look up subsidized housing in Nunavut, these are the words that come up. Energize your career. Find your next exciting adventure in the Canadian Arctic. Google Inuit housing. Unsafe. 40% of Inuit are living in overcrowded housing compared to 6% of Canadians as a whole. Transient housing. Your salary. $106,587 to $126,340. On top of that, Northern Allowance, $15,000. Inuit housing. The average income for Inuit, $22,000. More. Broken windows and doors, damaged drywall and leaky pipes, transient housing, breathtaking landscapes, and amazing adventure opportunities. Inuit housing. If your income increases, so does your rent. Transient housing. It's the thought of dog sledding, snowmobiling, kayaking, and ice fishing sounds enticing. Nunavut is the place for you. Inuit housing. He works for the government and he's homeless. Transient housing. It's the thought of exploring a rich culture filled with distinct artwork and music sounds enticing. Nunavut is the place for you. I am contractually obligated not to say anything politically. Empty, waiting for job titles, not yet filled. Homes in homeland. the spatters of small box houses, blue, red, beige, and a little more beige in a land that is not white. Inuit Nunangat, Inuit Nunangat, Nunavut, Nuna. Brown rock braided with strips of green. Rivers eagerly searching and surging towards ever lower ground. And finally spilling orgasmically into the ocean. The ocean that rhythmically sends up white caps, mirroring the shapes of beluga whales swimming in the ocean. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lachlith. That was incredible. Uh, we now invite everyone to ask questions in the chat, and uh, Myra will uh, bring questions to Lachlith, who cannot see the chat because she is seated far from her computer right now. <laughs>
Thanks, Hillary. Sorry, I was muted. Um, like, look, let me start by just saying how the, 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 the questions are coming in. So I just wanted to say, I think we are all, um, I don't know, I, it, it's going to take me a while to, to formulate some words. That was brilliant. It was just mesmerizing and powerful and oh my gosh, th thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, let me turn to the, the questions in the chat. So um, here we go. So uh, uh, Xavier, I hope that's the, the right pronounce, uh, pronunciation of your name. Uh, he thanks you so much for this great performance. And he was wondering uh, um, whether the whether um, the last part of, of your play, of your performance, was really about an escape from uh, what he's saying is modernity. The last part of my poem is an escape from modernity. Not at all. Um, the land is modern, and our relationship with land is modern. Um, the, it's it's a continuous relationship, and by definition, that is contemporary. Yes, thank you. Um, a lot of I, I just wanted to say, like Luke, a lot of the comments that are coming in are. Are, are just expressing gratitude and saying how beautiful uh, your your poem is and how um, um, I'm reading some of these uh, wow profound and captivating beautiful staging for the zoom world so very touching um, more than more than one of us is actually crying right now so um, um, fantastic. Um, so um, here's a question. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the fire that's burning in front of you? I think it's a, a kulik. I'm probably mispronouncing that. But if you could tell us a little bit about, about that, please. Yes, absolutely. It's a or kudluk, depending on the dialect that you're speaking. And uh, this is, this is uh, the hearth of Inuit households. Uh, it is made out of soapstone and it's filled with oil, um, seal oil, beluga oil, vegetable oil, uh, and uh, lit with uh, a wick that's made from uh, willow and arctic cotton and all the little puffy um, things that come up with pussy willows um, up there on the land. And this is, uh, this is uh, the center of our um, kitchen, um, so source of warmth, uh, and what has allowed us to be alive um, since time immemorial here in the Arctic. It's a source of warmth and, and light. And so it's, uh, it's used ceremonially, like in a performance like today, uh, and it is also used um, practically where um, people dry their mitts and, and boots and, and also cook bannock uh, balaubak or meals over top of them as well. Um, so again, this idea that uh, there's, um, uh, there's only the contemporary. This has been with us uh, continuously. It sounds like contemporary doesn't necessarily have um, the same meaning as it would have in, you know, in in colonizing parlance. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. So, um, so we have a question about um, it. it um, asking whether you could talk a bit more about the contrast between, you know, settlers who are who are working and living in Nunavut, you know, uh, mostly temporarily, um, and Inuit peoples, you know, poverty, their 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 economic precarity, the housing crisis that you've so wonderfully captured in your poem, and. Um, the, the question is around, you know, are there ways in which in which uh, Inuit in Halawit and other, maybe other communities are resisting this this sort of this colonization? Mm. Yeah, I mean, everything about what we do is is um, a resistance of colonization. Uh, the fact that we still speak our language, 
the fact that we're reclaiming tattoos, the fact that we still hunt and provide for our families with seal meat and, and whale meat and, and all the other animals um, on the land uh, are all acts of resistance. Um, if it wasn't for the capacity for us to tell our stories uh, and the capacity for us to hunt for ourselves, Inuit culture would have been annihilated by colonization. Uh, and so we're continuously working against it. Thank you. Um, so we have another question about um, what what changes, if any, uh, have you seen over your lifetime in terms of things like uh, livelihood and housing and and that sort of thing? Like what what sort of what sort of yeah shifts or changes have you seen? Um, I I think that. Um... That's a bit hard to answer for me because, you know, everything is shifting or everything's staying the same and, and where's the balance between the two. Um, uh, I would say that um, what is happening uh, is that our population is very young and continuing to be young, uh, and even more young. Uh, and this is something that's actually affecting us quite a bit in the pandemic, uh, because um, more than two thirds of the population of Nunavut and many other Inuit regions um, is under the age of 18. And so up until we found out that uh, Pfizer is going to be able to give inoculations to teenagers, uh, there was no way of us getting herd immunity. Uh, so this is why we've had these isolation hubs, as I was mentioning in my performance. So what is happening is that um, as the years go by, uh, there's more and more young people and we need to be able to expand uh, what not, not just what they are capable of, but the amount of support that they need needs to become all encompassing around them. We have a situation that's quite different from the rest of Canada being so young uh, and it's actually completely full of potential. Mm. and love thank you thank you what what a what a moving answer to that um okay um so uh we we have a question about um about what can you know what can um you know some people call them allies what can what can people do to support you know non inuit what can what can people do to support um you know your 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 wonderful critique of colonialism how can how can other people help hmm. um yes there is so much material out there um, in libraries, in, uh, on the internet, um, and in experiences of, um, of non-Inuit interacting with Inuit. There's so much material out there. It is really important for non-Inuit to do their research, to really dig into the materials and uh, gain knowledge of, of what our world is like so that uh, when you do interact with Inuit, Inuit don't have to do the emotional labor of explaining uh, what colonization is, what our community life is, what is different about our life here. Uh, that is a huge thing, to be able to do your own research so that uh, it's much more of an equal uh, communication field for all of us. Okay, yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I, my apologies. I, um, I. That's a that's a fantastic answer. The 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 person asking the question, though, um, I misinterpreted um, them, and they want to know specifically what what can, um, what can Indigenous peoples from other, uh, from other places, perhaps in uh, South America, etc. How can they how can they join with with Inuit? Um, uh, on 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 this common project, mm, mm. Um, I think that is a very exciting realm, uh, especially because uh, it is actually about in, indigenous people being in communication with each other, uh, and 
I think I've been able to observe over the past year that even though we're not allowed to travel uh, and we're, we're stuck at home, all these connections are still happening. Uh, and I think it's through, you know, uh, becoming friends, working collaboratively on projects uh, and creating this snowball of getting to know more people and getting to more, know more people, uh, you develop a, a collaborative platform so that um, uh, so that the 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 span of understanding and cooperation uh, grows. Um, I was really struck. Uh, when was this? In two thousand nineteen, uh, I went to uh, Guanajuato in Mexico to per perform at the uh, Cervantes Festival. Uh, and what really struck me was that uh, colonization creates a gaze for colonized people. And so in North America, indigenous people uh, gaze towards, you know, the States and, and Ottawa and Toronto, uh, you know, where the white power lies uh, and don't realize how large the indigenous world is in, in, uh, in Latin America. Um, and that's, a, you know, a very, very, um, alive and uh, effervescent world uh, where we need much more connection. I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling. So I no, not that, at all. Like, <laughs> no, that's great. Um, so, uh, so here's another question. So why, do you, why is it important for you to use your art to explore topics of the continued impacts of colonialism um, on Inuit in, in Nunavut and, and to share this with non-Inuit? Mm. Um, I, I create art because it is a, a realm in which I, I can communicate. Uh, and um, I think that much like I was talking about how our lives are can only be contemporary, um, I think that expression finds doesn't have borders either. Uh, so using art to express myself politically is the same as saying um, I use politics to talk about art. You know, it's it's all a part of the same conversation. Uh, and I I create art for Inuit by Inuit, uh, and so I I speak from my own perspective uh, and the way that I speak to non-Inuit is so that you're invited into our conversation. Um, uh, it's not so much about catering to non-Inuit, it is, it is catering to Inuit so that we can share more with one another. Hmm. Thank you. Well, that actually that kind of leads into possibly a, a uh, a related question. Um, so we have a question about if you could share a little bit more about um, your process or method for writing poetry. Mm, sure. <laughs> I have three kids. Uh, we're in lockdown. My process is go find something pretty. Ten pretty things I need to write. <laughs> Yeah, it's, okay. uh, it's a very different realm right now, uh, living in lockdown and, and creating art uh, uh, and involving the kids uh, as well. I made sure that they were all here uh, while I was um, creating the set for you uh, and making sure that they're listening to, to what I'm trying to express as well. Um, but this process of creating art right now in, in the time of the pandemic is, um, is something else. <laughs> And, and another question we have related to this is, are you, uh, are you developing any projects that you're really uh, excited about for, um, you know, that, that, you're, that you're developing now? I think people are very excited to, to, to know more and to, 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 to digest more of, of what you uh, m might offer us. Ooh, <laughs> that's great to hear. <laughs> um, yeah, my um, next project coming up, um, 
well, the next big project coming up is in the uh, late summer. Uh, I'm going to be working with a Canadian and Danish production team to make um, a virtual reality film um, about Dark Dupaduk. And uh, Dark Dupaduk is a, is a real life island. Uh, you might have heard of it in English. It's, it's Hans Island. And it is this tiny, tiny 1.2 square kilometers island that is right in between Greenland and Canada um, and the international, you know, the borders between the two countries. Um, and it's been such a huge point of, well, actually it was a, a war waged between Denmark and Canada about who owned um, so-called Hans Island. But uh, uh, this film that we're making um, is about the inaugural speech that the president of the Republic of Dr. Baduk is giving to the world. Uh, and so, of course, the Republic of Dr. Baduk is um, an Inuit utopia, socialist and feminist and beautiful and raunchy and so on and so on. So we're making a really, um, we're going to be making a really uh, fun and uh, exploratory film in uh, virtual reality. I've never done it before. Um, and, and we have a question. Thank you. We, we, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm bombarding you with questions, but people, I can, oh. I can only, I hope that you will trust me when I say that the, the comments are so, people are just, there's exclamation marks and people, you have an invitation <laughs> to Acapulco and the Costa Chica. You, people are so excited. Um, so another, no, so another that. question. It's, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. If one of you could uh, copy all of like the whole comment se section and email it to me, I would I would love to be able to see that. Absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, there there's a question about um, whether you could possibly talk a bit more about about the the, the set that you have created around you, um, the the bones. Mm, yeah, sure, I would love to. Um, this is. Um, this is a caribou antler, Nessuk, and it is gigantic, as you can see. Uh, it takes up um, over a meter. And uh, this is uh, my family and I, we collected this uh, antler last summer, way down the bay. Uh, we took our boat and spent a day at this gorgeous waterfall. And it's actually the last time that we all ever swam <laughs> because of the pandemic of everything being closed. So we had this gorgeous day and this very, very old um, um, antler was in the ground and you can see that it's, it's all covered in lichen. Um, and then I've just been doing this thing of collecting different types of uh, shoulder blades. I just find them, I'm very enraptured with the shape right now. So I've got caribou shoulder blades, I've got little, Arctic hair shoulder blade and a seal. Nice. Um... Okay, we have another question here. We have loads of questions. So uh, we have a question here about, um, you know, in your poem, you talked about that experience, that visual, etc. experience of sort of flying uh, back into a Hallowit. And the question is around um, the the big, uh, you know, the West 40 dump and uh, the military, you know, trash, etc. And wondering if you could say a bit more about this relationship between uh, Inuit and um, this colonial and 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 military trash. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Iqaluit was established um, at the end of the Second World War and in the period leading up to uh, the Cold War. Uh, and so the the very long um, runway that we have here is actually is built by the American Army Base. Um, and uh, I've heard stories of of it going twenty four seven. Um, as, I mean, because there's 24 hours of light here in the summertime, it could just go. So they had tons and tons of, um, uh, not necessarily soldiers, they also brought in a lot of people on contract. Uh, and um, as, as it turns out, there was a lot of black people from the Southern states that were, that were brought here to work on the runways. So uh, that being said, there's 
that fast pace of creating this uh, community in uh, a, with a sense of panic because of the Cold War and missiles coming over from Russia and missiles going over to Russia uh, and this you know, a huge flow of people uh, with the American army being so hierarchical and racist. Um, there's so many different uh, things that happen very quickly here in the establishment of, of the Khadoui. Um, and so, yes, we've got this long runway. We have some um, army barracks uh, and we have distant early warning um, sites, which is where the, you know, the Americans would listen in. <laughs> my impression of them listening for, <laughs> for Russians coming over with their missiles. Uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of like very rushed uh, history of why there's so much military um, um, discard here in, in this community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, another question is about, um, could you speak more about uh, the consumption of Inuit culture by colonizing settlers and how that consumption might extend to your art and poetry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, there's, um, there's not a lot of conversations uh, that we have um, as Inuit artists, especially about uh, cultural appropriation. Um, and uh, the idea that, that Khatlunad settlers come here and, and um, cross that very fine line of being a part of the community and appreciating the culture that has lived on this land for millennia to creating objects uh, and uh, ideas and performance styles in order to make their own benefit you know, to, to make money, to, to make a transaction out of um, what they have learned for their own benefit. Um, and I think that's one of the most uh, burgeoning conversations that we've been having, having, having in this past year is, is who gets to define what, what that line is between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation and why we as Inuit are delineating where that line sits. Mm, very um, interesting. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't so, mean to interrupt her. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's this kind of conversation is existing in multiple realms of Inuit art uh, and, and, and it's ongoing. So I guess the other aspect to talk about is that um, uh, part of our colonial relationship is that uh, Inuit have always been performative to non-Inuit uh, and that comes from the initial contact between white people and Inuit where uh, Sir Martin Frobisher even stole, uh, kidnapped three Inuit and brought them to England and put them on display. Um, and you know the, the World Expos taking Inuit and putting them into zoos uh, for them to be on display. Um, and, and it goes on, all of these stories of all of these adventurers and explorers and discoverers coming to the Arctic, taking Inuit and putting them on display. Uh, and so I work uh, quite hard on breaking down those, um, breaking down those uh, impulses racist impulses to be performative um, and, and that actually builds uh, there's an awful lot of the stuff that I work on in my artistic practices is breaking down the performativeness of racist relationships. Hmm. Thank you. Um, okay uh, this might be a related question <laughs> we'll see. Um, uh, the question is, could you talk about the hybridity and fluidity between forms, storytelling, poetry, performance, video art, and so on? And do you create um, art in Inuktitut? Which, yes, you do. So, I'm going to say that 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 I'm going to say that
<laughs> uh, I do, of course, speak my own language uh, to my family and work hard on creating uh, work that is in, in my language as well. Uh, but yeah, the fluidity I, I, uh, between forms, um, I, I think it's really important to break down the silos between disciplines, uh, because what is important is that we search for creative excellence and we can't be bound by a, any certain realm or genre uh, and it's actually very important to me and to to all of us actually to be collaborative uh, because you know you want to be greater than the sum of the parts uh, because you want to be surrounded by thoughtful people uh, and because you want to be um, part of a movement. Uh, so I think that's, that comes, that's why, that's why I don't really stick to one particular genre of work. Okay, I, I can imagine that you might, you might very well be very tired. So we, we've just got a three or four minutes left. Um, and um, uh, this is a question from from uh, from Joy, but I I think I share this question, it, it, which is around the imagery that you used in your poem of the orgasmic, the ocean, the sensuality, and the this libidinal imagery. And um, mm -hmm. Joy's asking if you could say more about that intimate or sensual relation to the world, um, and how it might be a way of resisting. Um, the sort of, um, she's saying, abject colonization of waste on the environment. Um, mm -hmm. and, and she's asking, is this a kind of eco-sexuality or Inuit eco-sexual politics? <laughs> um, let me think about this for a second. I, I'm always like, oh, I should answer it right away, but I actually can take my time to answer, can't I? <laughs> um, Part of uh, what I do is uh, called uh, and this is Greenlandic mass dancing. Um, I didn't do it today, but it's, you know, a, a clown performance where I put on a black mask and put red lines and distend my cheeks and then crawl over people. Um, and uh, it's, it's an art form that comes from my maternal uh, family from Greenland that um, encourages the celebration of sexuality uh, and encourages respect for sexuality and respect for who you are as an individual and respect for everybody that you're surrounded by in their individual expressions as well. Uh, and so when, when I talk about like the ocean uh, being uh, covered in the orgasm of the, of the river or the, the licking uh, of the alluring blooms and things like that. It, it, it's about appreciating yourself within the realm of what is happening on the land at all times. Uh, and appreciating that intimacy is a really important part of um, seeing yourself as just a tiny part of the cosmos. It's, it's not to anthropomorphize what is happening on the land. Uh, it, it is actually uh, the point of, of making sure that you know that, that you're only, your humanity on the land is just a tiny speck in it all. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to do is the opposite of anthropomorphizing the land. It's, it's bringing the land into my experience uh, as a human. Hmm. Wow, that was so beautifully said. <laughs> um, listen, I think that, um, yes, and other people are writing in the chat things like, wow, <laughs> and thank you, thank you. Um, listen, I think, I think that that is a wonderful way to, to, end this wonderful gift that you have shared with us. So I would like to ask you, is there, is there 
anything else that you would like to like to say before um, we before we end this this I'd like to give you the last the last thing to say if you want you've already said so much um, and I can imagine that you must be exhausted so it's not to put any pressure on you at all it really is just to to say if you if you would like to say anything else we're we're all ears. Mm. Well, thank you very, very much for having me uh, and including me in all of the, the beautiful conversations you're going to be having over the next couple of days. I, I do want to pop in uh, when I'm able to, or to, to see what everybody else is working on. Um, it is such a strange sensation for me to be here and everybody inside my computer somewhere. So I would love to I'm really looking forward to reading the, the chat uh, once mm. somebody emails that to me later tonight. Uh, and I'm just so glad that you were able to be in my home with me today. Uh, well. Uh, and do continue to think about how to break down uh, racism, how to break down colonization, and how to break down the commodification of our personal relationships with land. Oh, well, on behalf of everyone, <laughs> uh, everyone here and everyone who will no doubt watch this video, um, thank you so much, Lakaluk, that you have given us your energy and your wisdom and your, your everything. We are so grateful. We are so excited. You will. You have sparked lots of conversation, lots of discussion, and and it's been very thought provoking. So, on behalf of the organizers of the Environmental Racism is Garbage Symposium and everyone who has joined us, we thank you so very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.